Um, my name's Kendra Kurtzen. My husband, I'm all by myself today. I have a whole family, and we'll talk about that. But um, my husband is a worship leader at our home church, so he is leading worship this morning and um, couldn't be here. And then my kids are, I have three daughters, and they are working at uh, VBS this week as camp counselors. So they're, um, yeah, it's just me today. <laughs> um, but uh, um, we're missionaries with Chi Alpha Campus Ministries. If you're not familiar with what that is, maybe you've heard of Crew or InterVarsity. They're, they're campus ministries on secular campuses around the country. Chi Alpha is the Assemblies of God chapter of that. Um, Chi Alpha's mission is to reconcile students to Christ, equipping them to reach the university, the marketplace, and the world for Jesus. There are currently 500 Chi Alpha uh, ministries around the country, um, and there are about 2,000 Chi Alpha missionaries. Um, so we've been a part of Chi Alpha for the last decade, the last 10 years, um, and we began in the, uh, 2015. Um, this is a picture of just our young family when we first began Chi Alpha. In 2013, we were um, first um, interns at Stanford University where we learned all about how to run campus ministries, and then from there, we pioneered a, mission, uh, a ministry at San Diego State University. Um, since that time, we've ministered to hundreds of students, um, many of them seen to come to know Jesus. Um, they've been equipped to share their faith with other um, students on their campus, and then when they graduate, they're able to do, do that in the marketplace. So the last decade has been a blast. Um, actually, doing campus ministry is so much fun. It's a party every weekend, working with young people. Um, students were worshiping in my home till wee hours of the morning, weekly. Uh, we had the opportunity to see a student transform their life with Jesus, and that's a, a, that's a, a moment in time that will affect the rest of their life. It affects um, who they marry, what career they have, how they raise their children, um, how they want to live and belong in this world. And so one student choosing Jesus changes the rest of their life, and it's, a, it's an honor to be a part of this ministry. Um, so this is what my family looks like today. Well, 2023, we need to get some updated family pictures. Um, but I now have teenagers. Um, you'll be happy to know that my husband's not the only boy in the family. We adopted that little dog, that Simon, and so he has a little pal now. Um, but our vision and mission over the last decade has been to um, raise up the next generation of leaders for Christ. And uh, this is Jeff Mike. You, you may ha recognize him. Um, this next slide. Uh, he led, he's led worship here a couple times and come with us. But this was our very first student leader that we ever met in Chi Alpha when we started at San Diego State University. Student leaders are really important to our ministry because they lead Bible studies in the dorms. They're the ones that plan events and they invite students to be a part of our ministry. So they're really influential. And so this was our very first um, student leader. And the next year he met Kelsey, who also joined our ministry. The two of them began dating. I'd like to think I set them up. Um, and I actually officiated their wedding um, several years ago. And they are now planting a Chi Alpha in Hawaii. So they're now in their second year. Um, yeah, and they're doing awesome. Um, their second year, they're already running 50 plus students a week. They've done several salvations and baptisms. And this summer, they took two teams like to the Philippines and I think another one to Guatemala for a mission trip. So they're just doing awesome and we're super proud of them. And then about five years into our ministry at San Diego State, we had a couple join us, and you may, re you may recognize them too. I think they've been here before, Daniela and Isaac Shoulderblade. Um, and uh, they also went off to pioneer a, a Chi Alpha campus in the New England area a couple years back as well. Um, and they have two kids, and they're seeing lots of success in their ministry. Um, and so it's just been really fun, these two families, Jeff and Kelsey, Daniela and Isaac, came from our ministry here in San Diego, um, and now they're uh, appointed missionaries with the Assemblies of God. Um, they actually were uh, commissioned together. It was a super special time um, at the AG office in Springfield um, to, be, to be missionaries with Chi Alpha. And so I'm not a grandparent yet, but I imagine this is what it feels like to be a grandparent, where you're sending off your next generation into the world. This is them at commissioning. Um, it's, it's like a part of you has left, but um, the ministry continues around the world. And so 
this is why we do what we do. Our mission has always been to, re to reach the next generation of leaders. Um, and so this is just some of the fruit that has come out of our ministry here in San Diego. Um, and we really couldn't have done any of that without this church. You guys have, whether you know it or not, <laughs> we're one of the nine missionaries that you guys support um, and have for the last decade. And so we really appreciate that. Um, so in the last couple years, because of our calling is really to reach um, the next generation of leaders, we felt that our call has shifted some. Um, during COVID, you know, we all had a lot of time to think and pray, and it led us to some new um, career options. So my husband has a PhD in theology, and um, he's now um, a, a, a theology teacher at several universities around the country, and he's also the resident um, theology a person that works for a Chi Alpha's um, diversity task force where they create curriculum and, and that sort of thing for our missionaries to make sure that diversity is welcomed in all of our campuses and we have the resources to foster that well. Um, and then for me, I've accepted a position with a Chi Alpha national office where I um, am a life coach to all of our missionaries that are on the field. So I, I now I work for the national program um, and I'm handed a handful of um, brand new missionaries in the fall every year that are starting a new ministry. And then I walk with them through the year, meeting with them on Zoom mostly because they're all over the country. Um, and I walk with them through the year to make sure their first year on campus is successful and they're set up for success. And I coach them if they have any difficulties or that sort of thing. So it's really been an honor. I've been doing that the last two years and just absolutely love it, feel like it's what I'm called to do. And um, and again, just thank you so much for your support because um, you're a part of all of this story. I mean, we couldn't do what we do without this church and, and your support. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what coaching is. I know it's like kind of a loaded word. Um, some people don't know what that means. So hopefully by the end of the day, you'll have a little more understanding of what a life coach does. Um, but something to be aware of when um, people kind of join this full-time ministry business <laughs> is that a lot of time they feel very alone. Um, when you're at the top and, and your job is to be the leader, um, the shepherd, the pastor, the one who takes care of every, everyone in this community, who is taking care of the pastor? Who does the pastor get to go to to vent or to express um, you know, disappointment or anything like that? And so a lot of times they don't have anyone to go to. And so that's what I get to do. I get to walk alongside pastors and give them the care that they need and have a safe person to talk to and that sort of thing. So, um, and, uh, so AG Coaching actually did a survey several years ago that measured pastors and missionaries that met with life coaches regularly. And it, they found out that they were 80% more likely to have healthy ministries meeting with a life coach. So coaching is a really powerful tool. Um, the word coach actually orig originated as a transportation device. So no, I'm not talking about like the football coach. <laughs> this is like a, a buggy type wagon coach is where the word um, originated from. It, it was a fancier, um, more creative way to travel besides those old wagons that had no cushions or springs or that sort of thing. And so coaching is just a fancier conversation. It's a way to travel through a conversation that's a little bit different than your everyday conversation because it fosters listening to the person that you're talking to and really holding space for them to talk and be heard. Um, that's really what coaching is. And so I want to talk to you about listening this morning and the power of listening, because um, I believe it produces the spirit of God in all of us. So um, that's what we're going to do a little bit this morning. I'd love to just open us up in prayer. God, I thank you so much for this church harvest time, for this sweet spirit that is here, God, for this community, and I just thank you that I get to be a part of it today. And would you just use me, God, to speak to the hearts of everyone here? Um, would they leave feeling refreshed and seen and known by you? Um, and we just praise you and thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So I saw a so social media post once about... Um, listening. And it asks this question, how do you feel when you're listened to? And how do you feel when you're not listened to? And these are just some of the words that people said. So take a minute, just look at this list. When someone is listened to, they feel appreciated, valued, loved, accepted, validated, worthy, significant, known. 
when they're not listened to, they feel disrespected, ignored, cast out, unworthy, alone, worthless, invisible, rejected. There's a stark difference between these two lists. To me, one sounds like the Spirit of God. This is what God does for us. And the other one is the opposite, the opposite of the Spirit of God. I love this quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The first service that one owes to the others is the, is the fellowship that consists in listening to them. Just as love to God begins with listening to his word, so the beginning of love for the brethren is listening, learning to listen to them. So I like to interact when I speak, and so I would love to hear some of your thoughts. What is it that causes us not to listen? Because it seems like such a simple thing, but obviously we're not doing it really well. So what are some of the reasons why we may not listen? And you can shout it out. We're going to be interactive here. Any thoughts? Too busy? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Selfishness? Other worries, distractions? Yeah. Not interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe the person's different than me, and I'm not interested. Yeah. Worries of your day? Oh, planning your day. Yep. Yeah. I'll never forget this one worship um, night we had at San Diego State University. Um, we had invited the students to experience the Holy Spirit, and we were just telling them, just listen to the music, rest in the Spirit, listen to what he has to say to you. And one of our students, her name was Dessa, she came up to me, and Jeff, who I talked about earlier, was with me. And she just shared with me, like, I'm frustrated. I don't know how to listen to the Holy Spirit. I don't know what that's like. Has anyone been there? One of, uh, so I thought of a million things, you know, like, I could quote her a Bible verse about how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I could pray for her. I could have given her some tips and tricks of how to sit with the Holy Spirit. Um, but this was a moment when the student became the teacher because Jeff, who was my intern at the time, did none of that. He actually just sat with Dessa and began to ask her questions. And the questions were, I, sat, I watched him for about 30 minutes just asking her questions and listening, and the questions were, what do you think the Holy Spirit is like? If the Holy Spirit did speak to you, what would that feel like? What do you feel the Holy Spirit in your body right now? And then it kind of turned into, what is hope? Where do you see hope? Where do you find joy? Where do you feel love? And by the end of that night, Dessa had an experience with the Holy Spirit that changed her life. And I don't know if that would have happened if she hadn't been listened to. James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So listening to one another produces the Spirit of God. Jesus was a great listener. Um, he listened to the woman he met at the well in John 4. He listened to two men he encountered on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. He listened to the woman who he healed in Luke 8. If you actually uh, study Jesus' life, he asked more questions than he did answer them. One of my favorite uh, stories of Jesus is actually found in Mark 10. Jesus is trying to leave the city of Jericho, and as he does, he's being followed by a large crowd. But the focus of his story is not on any of them. It's all actually on a man that wasn't in the crowd, and, his name, and he's a blind man, and his name was Bartimaeus. As the crowd passed, he called out for Jesus. The crowd yelled at him and tried to silence the man, but Jesus heard Bartimaeus and called him over. And then Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? 
I mean, obviously Jesus knew the man was blind. It seems obvious that what's he, what he wants is to be healed. But why do you think, this is another interactive moment, <laughs> why do you think Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? Why do you think Jesus asked that? Okay. Yep, to, to test his faith, to see if he had faith to be healed. Good, what else? To exercise his faith. Mm-hmm. Any other? If you ask, you shall receive. Good. What else? Hmm. Yeah. Yes, that God has seen him and is aware of his prayers, aware of his cry, and has seen his difficulty and knows him. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Why did Jesus ask, what can I do for you? He wanted to hear what he had to say. He wanted to show God's love. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of those things are true. I would like to think that God gave him autonomy. God gave him a moment. I don't think anyone probably ever asked this man what he wanted or what they could do for him. But Jesus did. He met him where he was at and asked, what can I do for you? And let the man tell him. And yes, he would have probably, obviously our first thing is to be healed from blindness. But what if the man was lonely? What can I do for you? Jesus wasn't assuming he knew. He let the man tell him. So what's our next steps to be more like Jesus when it comes to listening? And it doesn't happen overnight. It's practice. Um, When I first started training as a life coach, I thought I was a really good listener, um, but turns out I was not. And uh, we, we spend a whole class learning how to listen, which tells me that we don't know how. If we have to spend a whole class talking about what is listening, it tells me we don't know how. So I'm going to give you a little one-on-one coaching class today. This is straight from some of our training. Um, And these are just some tips of how to be a better listener. So first, actively listen. So what this means is usually in conversation, there's three conversations happening. The one where the person's talking, the one where the person's listening, and then the conversation that's going on in your head, right? So... Most of the time we think we're listening, but we're actually listening to our conversation in our head. And we're not actually listening to what the person is saying, which causes us to assume things. It causes us to think we're hearing, but really not. So we were taught in coaching to actually turn that head piece off completely. Try to turn it off and so that you're able to just listen to the person. And it's amazing what you'll hear if you're actually not listening to your own voice and you're just listening to what the person is saying. Number two is to summarize. So this really makes the person feel like they're being heard. If you can listen and then summarize back what you heard, and then you can maybe say, did I get that right? Or that sort of thing. And it really makes the feel, person feel like they were heard and they were listened to and they were understood. Um, empathize is the third one. So listen for the emotional language that's being used and empathize with it. So if they say... Uh, Or you could say, I see that you're really frustrated, or that might be hard for you. Before you jump into advice, it's just good to empathize first. I see that was really hard for you. That must have been really frustrating. I I see that you're really hurt by that. Sort of empathizing really makes the person feel heard and seen. And then empower. Don't try to solve their problems. Most of the time, if people want a solution, they'll ask for it. I see wives nodding and punching their husbands. Most of the time when people want a solution, they'll ask for it. Most of the time people just want to be heard and understood. They don't want you to fix their problems. If they do, they'll ask for it. So when talking to someone, um, it's good to not deal with the problem, but to, to just listen to what they're saying and then empower them to think for themselves, to empower them to ask them, what do you think you should do before you give your, because most of the time we have the answers within us. 
We just need to process it with somebody. So empowering them to come up with their own solutions that really fit them, they know themselves best. How can we empower them to um, live their best life, the one that God's called them to, not the one we've been called to? And then number five, tell me more. Many times when people are telling us stories, they will pause after a complete sentence. Um, and instead of jumping in with your own thoughts, a really great practice is to just say, what else? Because there's always something else. People will stop at the surface. But if you want to get to the bottom of what's really going on with the person, then ask, what else? Jesus based his whole ministry on asking questions. So I figure if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And this is how I do my ministry now, is I ask questions. Um, we know in Scripture, Jesus asked 307 questions, and he only answered three of them. Now, I'm not good at math, but it seems that, to me, every question that he answered, he asked 100 more. Jesus was more interested in the questions than the answers. So it's about being present with people as they question, resist, resist the urge to give the answer. It's being a witness to someone's journey that produces the Spirit of God. I really believe that just listening can do all the healing that a person needs. Because all we really want is to be heard, listened, and belong somewhere. And you can do that in your life. It can be your ministry. So in closing, um, I'll just leave you with this psalm. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, but his, hear, his ears are attentive to their cry. The eyes of the Lord is on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. So I just love for you to take a moment. So we'll, we'll close out here. Um, but if you could just sit, close your eyes, take a deep breath. What is your cry to the Lord today? Like we just talked about, Jesus is the ultimate listener. So i just love for you to take a minute. What is your cry to the Lord today? We just read, God is attentive to your cries. So just take a minute. Can you put it into a sentence? What are you crying out for the Lord today? And then take, a, take another deep breath and then ask God, what question are you asking me? God, I just lift up all these cries. I thank you that you ask us questions. You give us power over what it is we do next and how we live out our life for you. I pray that all these cries would be answered. God, I just lift up our country right now. I pray that in the midst of chaos and what seems challenging, that we would listen more that we would listen to you, that we would ask more questions, and ultimately you would guide us to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.